the bulk of my talk is actually going to be about a specific example of this idea that I'm calling merging neural circuit uh, models with deep learning. But I'm just going to start by kind of explaining what I mean by those terms and what it means to merge them. Uh, and then I'm going to, at the end, talk about uh, more generally uh, how this could be applied in, in different settings. So to start, um, I'm sure most people here know what deep neural networks are. Um, but basically, the, some of the, the benefits of deep neural networks are that they can be trained to perform complex tasks, and they're, uh, they can do so because they're made up of very abstract um, units that are meant to mimic very the very basics of how um, neurons work in terms of turning inputs into outputs, and then they're kind of pieced together in very simple architectures, uh, frequently feed-forward architectures, that are then trained via backpropagation to perform tasks. Um, because the units and the architectures are uh, more abstract, even though they're inspired by neuroscience, um, and they're not kind of constrained to, uh, to meet all the, the same requirements that the brain does, um, so there's a lot of biological detail that they lack, because of that it's not always clear how to directly relate a network that's been trained on a certain task to the area of the brain that we believe is doing the same task. Um, obviously, some people have done this successfully in terms of comparing representations of training networks to representations uh, in the visual system in particular, but in general, you don't always know how to take part of the model and compare it to part of the brain. On the other hand, um, computational neuroscience for many decades has been focused on building neural circuit models. So these are kind of these types of uh, networks that you've probably seen in papers, uh, frequently in the last figure of an experimental paper. Um, but they are explicitly built to uh, match what is known about neural anatomy and usually use it to explain features of neural activity. So you can observe different um, types of neurons in the brain and how they're connected, and using that information, you can piece them together in a mathematical model, and hopefully if you piece them together right, they'll produce uh, neural activity that looks like neural activity that the real circuit produces. And in this way, they're biologically detailed because they usually include uh, neural models that are more um, have more in common with the real neurons in the circuit that's being studied, and the um, architecture is um, specifically defined by what's known about the real architecture. The drawback of these models is they don't tend to perform complex tasks. So they're meant to mimic a small circuit in the brain, and they're meant to mimic the activity of the neurons in that circuit, but they're not usually pieced together in a way where this circuit can do complex real-world tasks the way that deep neural networks can. So the benefit, in my mind, of merging these two different approaches um, to understanding the brain is that if you take um, from the, the uh, neural circuit models, they provide the relevant biological details that we might want to include in our models of the brain, um, in particular because they've kind of been uh, hand-designed to include the parts of the biology that we think are necessary for what we're trying to understand about a brain area. So they're kind of pared down. It's not just like you're looking at the data directly and saying, oh, I see all these features in the data, maybe I should try putting them all in my model. There's already been a stage of processing that tries to identify what the important uh, parts of the data are. And then by putting those uh, details into a deep neural network, you can actually test functional consequences. And that's because the deep neural network can perform tasks um, that are more complex than any uh, hand-designed neural circuit can do. So um, by putting in these details, it also just makes the models more directly relatable to data overall. If you do some new recording in a brain area or you learn something new about the anatomy, uh, when you have a model that already has specific details from the biology in it, it's easier to know how to work that new information into the model. Or if you find out something interesting in the model, it's easier to know how to relate that back to the data. Uh, when you have a model that has parts that are meant to match uh, the data. And then on top of that, if you're studying or using a neural circuit model that um, has existed in the <coughs> literature for a while, there's been many papers written about that neural circuit model and um, how to understand it and its behavior in different circumstances. So you're tapping into a potentially broad existing literature when you try to understand um, the network that you've trained. So the example that I'm going to talk about is um, the, uh, the specific neural circuit is called the stabilized superlinear network, and it's meant to uh, mimic certain properties of visual cortex. So uh, the way it works is that it's comprised of pairs of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, so excitatory in red, inhibitory in blue, and um, in this version of the SSN, those neurons are arranged on a ring, and you can think of each pair of um, ENI cells 
at each different location on the ring having a different preferred feature. In this case, it's easiest to think of it as a different preferred orientation. Uh, and so uh, nearby neurons on the ring will have nearby preferred orientations. And then uh, all together, they represent the full range of orientations. And you can think of this as representing a single spatial location. So these are different orientation to neurons uh, that have the same spatial receptivity. And uh, the, um, the, the model itself, uh, the rate of a neuron in this uh, model is a function of the uh, stimulus that's being applied. So what orientation are we saying that we're presenting to this model? Uh, and so you can see here that if uh, we're presenting a vertical orientation to the network, the pair of neurons that will that, uh, prefer that uh, orientation get the most feed forward input. This you can think of as feed forward input from the stimulus. And then the nearby neurons who have slightly different preferred orientations get less and less input. So this is the shape of the input to the network that's meant to represent the um, incoming stimulus. And it can be scaled by an overall contrast parameter. And then in addition to this input, uh, the network obviously also gets recurrent input from the other cells in the network. And this is the weight matrix that we're using. So you can see that uh, the connections between these different pairs of ENI cells falls off with distance. Uh, and then once these uh, two types of inputs are summed together, uh, the activity of the, the neuron is the result of uh, that sum being passed through a nonlinearity. And uh, importantly, this uh, N exponent here, which defines the nonlinearity, is uh, it's between two and five, and that's a value that comes from the data. And so that makes these uh, neurons individually super linear. So uh, if this uh, network were just comprised of excitatory cells getting a bunch of strong um, mutual ex excitation, then this network would be unstable because it has a super linear transfer function and it would be, um, it would, uh, its activity would go up to infinity. However, the strong connections with the uh, inhibitory neurons uh, serve to rein in that excitation, and this network is in, uh, an inhibition-stabilized regime. And so uh, the result is that it is stable because of the inhibition that's recruited, even though the individual neurons are um, superlinear and would themselves be unstable. Uh, so in addition to kind of mimicking some of what's known about the anatomy and the physiology of the neurons in, uh, in the visual cortex, it can also replicate one of the uh, computations that is uh, found in the visual cortex, and that's cross-feature normalization. And so by normalization here, I simply mean uh, sublinear summation. So if you show the network two uh, different stimuli at once, uh, the response to those two stimuli together will be less than the sum of the response to each of those stimuli alone. And you can see that here, so this is plotting the firing rate of all the neurons in the network arranged by their preferred orientation. And when you show one stimulus, you get a bump of activity around the cell that prefers that orientation. Another stimulus has a bump in a different location. And here in black, I'm showing the actual response of the network when both of these inputs are on together. And you can see it falls in between the sum of these two responses and the mean. So the network is doing sublinear summation of the inputs that it's getting. And so um, in feature space, this is called cross-feature normalization. And it's something that is observed uh, throughout the visual hierarchy. So this is an example in V1. Uh, if you show a V1 neuron uh, different oriented stimuli, you can see, uh, again, there'll be a bump in the population activity around that preferred, around uh, that orientation. But then if you show two of these stimuli together in an overlapping plaid, uh, the response is less than the sum of these two. So this is happening in V1. Uh, this is an example from IT where you can show two different objects in the receptive field of uh, an IT neuron. And um, you can see that uh, the response to the two objects presented at once uh, is closer to the average of the response to each of the two objects presented separately uh, rather than the sum. So this is just examples of cross-feature normalization uh, happening throughout the, uh, the visual hierarchy. Now, uh, convolutional neural networks are models of the visual hierarchy, and so uh, basically the mapping there is just different layers in the convolutional neural network uh, would map to different areas in uh, the ventral stream, usually. And um, so we kind of can think of the SSN because it's doing a computation that exists throughout the visual hierarchy as kind of being a canonical uh, circuit that might be present at each um, area in the, ventral, in the ventral stream. Uh, 
And so the idea of putting together these models is that you have a feedforward model of the ventral stream uh, in a, a convolutional neural network, and we have a sense of what the uh, recurrence at each layer of um, the ventral stream is based on this SSN model. And so specifically how you can add uh, these details into the model, um, so I'm focusing on only adding uh, details of the SSN at layer five, um, but uh, so first what I'm doing is constraining the um, input to layer five to be non-negative because the input to the SSN is non-negative, uh, and then I'm adding recurrence at this layer. And uh, the, instead of using the normal rectified linear unit as my um, uh, activation in the convolutional neural network, I'm going to take the equation that I showed you for the SSN. So I showed you the steady state. This is just the dynamics of uh, those neurons. And um, because this is a rate-based model, uh, it's fully differentiable. I can just run it forward uh, using Euler method. And in this case, I'm running it for 11 time steps with a, um, a time step of two milliseconds. So it's running uh, 22 milliseconds of simulation time. Uh, that's what's happening in this recurrence. Um, so that's kind of the, so because it's uh, differentiable, you can just train the network with backprop with the, this type of neuron in it instead of your normal ReLU unit. Um, and so uh, that would just be kind of the, the basics that we can add that comes from the SSN is using this kind of um, neural unit instead of a traditional ReLU, but then there are more details that come from the SSN that we can also add. So uh, for example, when you just add recurrence here, uh, you wouldn't expect there to be separate E and I cells. Traditionally in these networks, you don't enforce Dale's law. So we can also enforce Dale's law and have half of the feature maps here um, be excitatory and half be inhibitory. So now there are constraints on the sign of the weights of the recurrence at this layer. Uh, we can also uh, use that um, N exponent in the, uh, the definition of the activation function to use uh, to make the neurons either uh, more similar to a rectified linear unit or to make them super linear like they are in the SSN. Uh, and then also, when you have the recurrence here, by default, you would expect that all of the feature maps can um, recurrently impact each other. So there would be all-to-all -all connectivity in feature space, but we can also restrict the connectivity <laughs> like it is in the SSN, uh, where the uh, connectivity falls off with distance. And then also, this doesn't come directly from the SSN because the SSN is just a one layer model, but we do know from biology that um, excitatory cells tend to be the ones that send projections to the next layer rather than both E and I cells sending projections. So once we've added separate E and I cells to this layer, uh, we can make it such that only the E cells send uh, projections onto the next layer. So those are all the details that I'm going to add um, in sequence to the architecture. And then once I add a detail, I'm just gonna train the whole network um, with backprop uh, to see kind of what falls out of the network once we add these details. Does it make the network uh, match the biology in other ways? And so one of the, uh, the ways that I'm going to, uh, or some of the ways that I'm going to measure kind of what happens in the trained network is uh, these features of excitatory and inhibitory populations that have been observed in sensory cortex. So we know that um, inhibitory neurons tend to fire more than excitatory. Activity between pairs of I cells is more correlated than between pairs of E cells. Correlations tend to fall off over time during the response to a stimulus. And also, as I said before, cells perform sublinear summation. Uh, so those are the main things I'm going to check. I'm bringing up this other detail, uh, which I'm not actually going to talk about, but it's just an example of the benefit of using an established neural model. So this is from a paper that uh, mathematically analyzes the SSN model. And uh, from that paper, we can kind of reduce the uh, parameter state of the model to these two parameters, omega E and omega I, that are based on the recurrent connectivity as well as the feedforward drive. And so we know from that paper what we would kind of expect the biological regime of these parameters to be. And so this is just opening up a new way of analyzing a trained neural network based on uh, what we know about this existing neural circuit model. But I'm not gonna go into the results from that. Okay, so uh, these are the features that I'm testing in my trained model to see if they, exi if they exist. And then I'm going to add the features that I said uh, already. So if you just add the recurrence, um, you get this effect of correlations decreasing over time, and you only get a small percentage of cells showing sublinear summation. If you then separate the recurrence into separate E and I populations, you get this effect of inhibitory cells firing more than excitatory ones, and the amount of 
uh, cells performing sublinear summation goes up. If we change the, so now I'm adding, uh, it both has ENI and um, has a superlinear uh, activation function. So when I put that in, uh, the same results here, but now the percentage of cells that have sublinear summation uh, goes up even more, which could be a result of the fact that once this sub, uh, superlinear activation function is used, the recurrence is actually having the same effect that it has in the SSN, where the inhibition comes in and pushes the activity back down, so the net result is sublinear summation. Uh, then when I restrict the connectivity in feature space, you actually get a drop in the amount of uh, sublinear summation would suggest that in this network maybe it actually needs um, kind of wide inputs to perform proper uh, sublinear summation. And then interestingly when you add or when you put this constraint where only the excitatory cells um, can be the cells that send the signal on to the next layer, you now replicate this uh, finding about correlations and the um, amount of uh, sublinear summation goes up. Um, so uh, I, I would say that um, this kind of approach of adding the details one at a time and seeing how they impact the, um, the, the network is useful for understanding what uh, each of those details do and also when you might expect to see kind of bi the biological solution arise. So in this case, we would say that the biological solution is the SSN. We kind of know the answer in this case and we can kind of see under what training circumstances you can get something that looks like the SSN. You can also just put the SSN itself in as the recurrent connectivity. Um, in that case, you don't train the recurrent weights, you only train the free forward rates in the network, and um, you can kind of just see how they end up using this circuit that you've placed in there. And in that case, uh, the amount of sublinear summation is high because we know that the SSN performs sublinear summation. Um, but I want to talk about this approach of just putting the network in in the context of studying attention. And the reason for that is um, that uh, I said that the SSN performs normalization and uh, there's something called the normalization model of attention uh, that suggests that the neural circuits that are involved in uh, performing normalization um, are what are modulated by attention. So uh, uh, you can, so this started off as kind of a descriptive model where you can use a normalization equation and show that if you bias the terms in it, you can replicate some of the effects of attention on neural activity. Um, but also it's the case that uh, the extent to which a cell shows um, uh, modulation uh, by attention is correlated with how much it normalizes its inputs. So there's this relationship observed in the responses of cells uh, between how much they normalize their inputs and how much they're modulated by attention. And so that suggests that it's uh, attention, top-down attention signals are acting on the, the circuits of, of normalization. So to model attention in the SSN, um, we simply give an extra boost of input to the excitatory cells that represent the attended stimulus. Um, so the, the top-down attention signal has the same shape as a stimulus signal would have, but it's only going to the excitatory cells. And when you do that, um, you can see here I'm plotting in purple the response of this pair of ENI cells to uh, two different stimuli presented at once. And um, the, when you apply attention to this stimulus, you can see that the firing goes up, so this is attending the preferred stimulus of this uh, neuron. If you apply attention to its uh, non-preferred stimulus, its firing rate goes down, and that's solely an effect of the recurrent connectivity because I'm only, in that case, putting excitatory input into the excitatory cells on this side of the ring. So the recurrence pushes this activity down. Uh, and this effect happens in uh, both the E and the I cells, even though I'm only giving input to the E cells. And this uh, change in both E and I is observed uh, experimentally with attention. So the model can replicate this finding about the correlation between um, normalization and attention. It can also replicate a bunch of other findings um, about the neural effects of attention in visual cortex. Um, but I want to uh, talk about using this model in the context of this hybrid uh, deep learning approach. So um, for this work, I'm using a smaller network. Um, it's a two-layer convolutional neural network where at each of the layers I've just put in the SSN architecture. So I'm not training the recurrent weights there. I'm taking the exact parameters that this model, um, that we found for this model in developing it to fit uh, visual cortex data. And I'm just putting those directly in here. And so there's one of these ring SSNs at each of the spatial locations um, in this layer. So you have these 2D feature maps 
that uh, are the two uh, dimensions of spatial location, and you have one of these ring networks at each one. And so it's linking the feature maps uh, at each spatial location. And so uh, when you train the network, so we're training the feed forward part of the network and keeping the recurrence constant, um, but when you train the network, then you get this um, effect where now nearby uh, feature maps are, have correlated tuning. So previously, the notion of a nearby feature map didn't mean anything because um, each of the filters are just applied independently, so the feature maps that you get in a convolutional layer are just uh, randomly ordered. But once you put in this ring network that's connecting them, now you have some relationship uh, in feature space there. So what you're, I'm showing here is um, uh, the tuning strength to different digits that I presented to the network uh, for different um, feature maps uh, that's on the x-axis. And so you can just see that there's a relationship where nearby um, feature maps will prefer the same digit and not prefer the same digit as well. Whereas uh, that's in the red and in the blue is just a normal um, convolutional neural network that doesn't have this relationship. And so obviously the preferred digits are completely unrelated uh, between the different feature maps. So uh, to test um, attention in this network, we have to give the network a challenging visual task. And so the, net, uh, the, the task that we give the network is to try to identify an attended digit in an image that has two digits overlaid on top of each other. And so uh, this image will be fed into the network and it can be fed in both in the context of applying attention at uh, the SSN layers or without attention. Uh, and again, attention is applied the same way, extra excitatory input to the excitatory cells that prefer the digit. So that's based on the tuning I just showed you. We know which excitatory cells prefer the digit. And then the final layer is just uh, replaced with a binary classifier. So if we're attending the digit four here, this is a binary classifier that knows to detect four versus not four. And when you apply attention this way, um, you can see that there are some neurons in the network. These are just two neurons I pulled from the second layer. They have dynamics that are the result of the recurrence that this network has. And also when you apply attention, some of them have an increase in firing rate and some of them have a decrease as we've seen experimentally. Looking at the performance of the network, you can see that across most of the digits tested, uh, when there is not attention applied, the performance is lower, and when we apply attention to the excitatory cells in this network in this way, uh, we actually do increase the binary detection performance on these challenging overlaid images. So this is just connecting the neural mechanisms that have been observed for attention with the performance benefits that have also been observed with attention. And if you're interested in that, there's a preprint available for this work on attention. So um, that, to me, kind of explains some of the benefit of merging these biologically detailed models with um, models that can actually perform a function, especially in the context of studying something like attention. Um, I just want to speak more broadly to other possible ways that this kind of approach can be used. So there are a lot of circuit models that have been studied in computational neuroscience. Um, in the context of visual processing, there are models of biologically plausible uh, max operations. So max pooling is used in convolutional neural networks and we could be implementing it in a more biologically plausible way. Um, obviously, people have studied attractors for um, memory in a lot of different systems, so they're well studied and could be put into uh, an architecture, and you can train the architecture around them to see how a deep neural network would use that kind of uh, feature. And other circuits, such as uh, decision-making circuits or winner-take-all networks could also be um, implemented. So uh, to summarize, um, I would say that neural circuit models um, offer a compact description of the important biological features that we might care about in building computational models. And by uh, merging these existing models with deep neural networks, is, uh, it offers a new way of relating the deep neural networks to uh, data. But on top of that, it also offers a new way of relating structure to function in these models. And then in the particular example that I showed, um, putting the SSN into a convolutional architecture uh, offered a new way of studying the neural and the behavioral effects of attention. So, thank you.